that's it. We're going to start. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I'm Emma. I'm from the University of Edinburgh, and I'm going to share with you today how to work with your editors to co-design a Drupal editorial interface that supports good content design and winning user experiences. So here's an outline of my talk. I'm going to give you a bit of background context about me, what I do, um, and then I'm going to dive into looking at editorial interfaces and what they do and how important they are in supporting good uh, UX and content design. And I'm going to think about uh, reimagining the editorial interface and talk about co-designing that, working with editors, understanding what editors need, and then prioritizing features in the interface to support those needs. I'm then going to finish up with some tips and reflections working to align uh, design and development within an agile framework which supports co-design. And as I go through my talk today, I'll make um, reference to quite a few uh, different resources and books. So I'll provide a resource list at the end, and then we'll go into Q&A. OK, so I'm a content designer, stroke user researcher, stroke UX specialist, who's also really enthusiastic about service design. And I work in a design and development team at the university. We're a central um, team, central information services team at the university. And the university's been around a while. It has heritage, founded um, 1583. And these days we support 45,000 students. We have 15,000 staff and we have 21 what we call schools. So these are like subject areas, departments and three colleges and various other institutes and departments as well. And I've been the UX lead on our upgrade project from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 to migrate all the content on our site and to engage our editors and bring them along on this journey. And key to that was the editorial interface, still is the editorial interface. Before diving into that, just to give you a flavor of the uh, University Web Estate, we're looking at several million pages and we have more than 600 uh, subsites. And our editors are a devolved community, 300 plus um, editors, many of them very highly intelligent, many of them with academic backgrounds. So that's kind of, kind of what we're looking at. And the content that they're creating across the Web Estate, who's looking at that? Well, a key audience for us is prospective students because they're coming to the university website to do various tasks. And this is why content design of our website and our web pages is so important because it's supporting students, prospective students, making decisions like, am I el eligible to apply to the university? Is it right for me? I want to fill in a form, I want to send in my application, I want to browse what the university has and understand if it's right for me. So typically how those web pages come into being is through this sort of model. So those editors I talked about, they plug in the text, the images, the video into the CMS and out come the other end, the web pages. And how we deliver our, our Drupal 7 offering to, to that editor group is typically the central team in which I work produce the editorial interface, we deliver that to them, we have a service management team that design a training course, they have to complete the training course before they get the keys to the kingdom to be able to use the editorial interface to publish content. After that, they're kind of free to, to do that publishing themselves, um, we have obviously support calls, so if they get stuck, they can, they can come and contact us. So going into this pro project, this upgrade as, as the UX lead, I really, I could understand how important it was to bring editors along with this. And I wanted to understand from their perspective how this process was working for them. This was like in Drupal 7. And here's some of the things I found. So I was asking them about the training and they were going, there's just so much to remember. I do the training one week, I have to update content the next, I've forgotten everything. When I was talking about, asking them about the system, they were going, well, it wants me to work in this way. It is making me do this. I would really, really rather work this way, but it's making me work this way. And talking about the support side of things, th a lot of the time they were saying, I don't bother ra raising a support call. I just hack it. I've got a workaround. And all this made me think that they were had like quite a negative um, relationship with the um, interface. And moving to Drupal 9, it made me think, have we got an opportunity to do things differently and do things better here? So could we get to a stage where we had an interface that supported editors in their natural workflows, but also led to that kind of overarching goal of, of good content design and good UX? So this is what I mean by reimagining the editorial interface. What if instead of it was something we built for them, they, we built it with them? So what if it instead of it was something we 
like they felt restricted them, it actually empowered them. And what if it was something that they didn't have to learn how to use or feel it was a barrier to learn to use because they'd already been invested in the development process and they knew the system well. This is just a visual of, of that kind of reimagined um, editorial interface. So as well as the text and images and videos going in, there'd also be ideas and mechanisms going in and that would kind of I guess serve as the oil to lubricate the system keeping running and being more sustainable. So you might say, nice idea, Emma. How are you going to get there? Um, well, how I thought about getting there was something I learned about in my service design um, learnings, uh, which is co-design. So what's co-design? So co-design recognizes that when you design a service or a system, so in this case our editorial part of our CMS, there's not only expertise to feed into that from the people who operate the service, so people like me, content designers, developers, and the team that I work, the, the operators. There's also expertise from the service users to be captured, in this case, the, the editors. And being able to harness those two types of expertise in this case and put those together really helps to build a service that's got mutual benefits across the board. And much of what I've learned about co-design comes from a book, um, K.A. McCurch's book, Beyond Sticky Notes. It's a fantastic book. And in it, they outline these six co-design mindsets. And I've, it's two that really resonated with me in the work I've been doing, which is elevating lived experiences and valuing many perspectives. So thinking about elevating lived experiences, that's what I wanted to get from editors understanding what, how they naturally worked with this interface. And depending on where you are, if this is something that's of interest to you, if you want to do this, you can go in at different levels. And it obviously depends on this spectrum how well you know your editors from the beginning. If you have a pretty dissociated relationship with them, you, you'll need to reach out. You'll need to kind of have like icebreakers. And one of the best like icebreaker activities is a, a top task survey. This has been devised by Jerry McGovern. Um, and it basically lists all the tasks you can do, in this case with the CMS, and it gets those people using it to go, can you rate these? Can you tell me your priorities? So from that, you get a real clear picture of, of what the priorities are for those people um, within the system. Once you've broken the ice, you can get into more active listening. And this essentially means approaching editors and asking them to use the interface and, and find out how they work and get them to talk through like what they're doing. And this really, to get this to work really well, you need to have an element of trust because you don't want them to tell you what they think you want to hear. They don't want, you don't want the, I read the manual and then I just complete the pages because you know that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. So you really do want to get to a stage where you're listening to the hacks and the workarounds and, and hearing it all. Um, and yeah, to kind of encourage that process, you have to be quite open with your own work as well. So from our perspective, like sharing what we're doing within the team as we were going through this upgrade and making sure we're being open and inviting them in through maybe like sharing our prototypes, which was really scary, but it was good because we got to see how they would naturally interact with them and we learned from that and we started to build that relationship. And I'm not gonna lie, it felt like this when I started this project, um, learning from editors, like the head exploding emoji. Um, and many of them who knew what I was doing in the work of this upgrade, they, they were ready with the features that they wanted to see in the interface. So carousels, can I have accordions? I want expanding feature boxes. And uh, you really do have to hold your nerve at that point, I would say, if, if this is something that interests you and you want to go through this process, because you, it's achieving that deep understanding takes time. And this took time. So this is um, a concept known as mental model mapping. What this basically does is it takes a task that you choose one that maybe all the editors are doing. So in this case, it was producing a page about a course, standard, standard thing that all our editors do across the university. We have a degree program, they want to put a course page uh, together about it. This breaks down every single task that's involved in that um, production. So what you can see there, I'm gonna zoom in on this in a minute, uh, the yellow stickies are all those tasks and the pink stickies below are the opportunities for co-design. So I guess the top level is the editor expertise, the bottom level is like my expertise where that can come in. So let's see how that plays out. So here are four stickies, a typical sequence of events of editors um, going through a process uh, to produce that page. Clone an existing page, take a bunch of text that they've probably got from an academic colleague, so it's gonna be hundreds and hundreds of words, 
paste it in, realize, ah, that's a really long page, go to accordions, shorten it down, and then think, oh, I need to get this page noticed, I need to link it to that page, I need a button here. So that was something that's happening and they're doing. So I looked at that and I was thinking, okay, so what are the underlying needs here? And this is a key part of, of co-design is understanding what, what's behind this. So the cloning an existing page, the reason for that is because a blank page is the scariest thing ever to some of our edi editors because that requires them having to think how they're gonna structure it. So maybe what they're looking for here is not a copy of a page, it's actually a way to structure this particular sort of content. The copy and pasting, standard thing that you'd find in a CK editor, but the way it works now is that they can just put, they're, they're creating more work because they're putting tons of words in and then they're having to retrofit that. So what if the interface could be better configured to, to like maybe encourage them to chunk up the text so that they don't have that legwork later on? And similarly with the buttons and the links, that's a kind of retrofit reactive bit of work that they're having to do there. So maybe is there a way that the interface can lead them through creating uh, connected content better? And talking about the other like principle of co-design is valuing like broad experiences. And so before you start getting to features from that stage even, you broaden it out again and you think about, okay, what's available in the Drupal community that could support how these features work? What's available in terms of editor empowerment, um, things that, that would control how features work, because it's not just about putting a feature in an interface, how that actually works and if it does the job that you intended it to do will depend on a lot more. And I want to focus on editor empowerment because this is really crucial. So if you put a feature into an interface, if the editor uses that or how they use it is going to depend on their behavior towards it. And every behavior is underpinned by a capability opportunity and motivation. This is the combi model um, from behavioral science. So an editor would, if they wanted to use a feature, they'd need to feel familiar with it. They'd need to know what it did. They'd need to have some kind of idea of onboarding or maybe like through a how-to guide um, that feel that they could actually use it. They need to have the opportunity to use it. So if it's sat there in the interface and it's buried beneath all the other paragraph options, they might not, and, and they don't really know what it does. They might never actually think, oh yeah, I'm gonna use that to structure my page. So the interface can support that by choice architecture to put things in front of people and to actually describe them with labels that are meaningful to them. There's also an element of motivation, and this really comes, um, th the value of peer support um, comes from that building relationships with editors, because editors will learn from other editors They'll listen to another editor way more than they'll listen to somebody like me saying this is the way to do it. So you need to bear that in mind with every feature that, that's like planned out in the roadmap for the interface, there's an element of, of putting effort into this side of things as well. Yeah, so just playing that out, I guess, like um, thinking back to that example of a, of a program page or a, content, a course page, you could choose a content type for that, say that's your feature that you're going with, Okay, great, but also tap into what's been known in the, the Drupal community about views because that could help make that feature work in the best way. And also make sure that that content type is something that editors are going to recognize when they, when they go to pick it in the interface. Similarly, you could go for tags for the connected content problem. Make sure that there's an actual strategy for connected content so editors know what that's all about and draw on expertise from the Drupal community in terms of taxonomies and groups. So this is, th like prioritizing features this way hopefully gives you an idea of how th this is a better way of doing it. And I will say it's a slower way of doing it. I'm working in a team with developers where you're asked about what, what they're to build and what, what they need to, what editors want a lot. It can be difficult to kind of go through this methodical process. But what I will say is what you end up with, with things that are prioritized have been built like by the people for the people. It's a more sustainable approach. Um, and it runs less risk of, of technical expertise, I guess, being put into building features that then don't get used or they don't hit the mark. Just touching on that aligning design and development within the Agile framework, because this, this is, this is kind of crucial to, to this um, whole co-design process. So how it, might how it typically will work is in an Agile framework, it'll have a series of sprints, um, there'll be the UX and design work, and that can be around particular features of the interface that are like outlined on those top cycles there. There'll also be development cycles. 
It helps to acknowledge that these operate at different velocities. And once that's known, you can arrange things so that the UX and design is maybe feeding into the development. There's always a two-way process of, of learning from each other, but it helps if they're staggered slightly. It also helps uh, kind of on that to respect each other's um, priorities um, and processes. So developers' processes that matter to them will be things like documentation, user acceptance testing before merging any changes, experimenting with functionality to learn about the potential. From the design side of things, it'll be convergent, sorry, divergent and convergent kind of design process like the double diamond, sketching, prototyping, mapping out user flows, like ascertaining what's, what needs to be in the UI, and also disseminating um, user research findings. Once you know the differences and you know the different priorities, you can look for common ground. So with, from the design side of things, when you're looking to converge, when designers like me are looking to converge on what, what do we need to focus on, use that documentation that the developers have created, learn about the capabilities, and use that to think about how to focus the efforts best. User research findings, the UAT uh, document is an ideal place to disseminate that information to pass it to developers. So not only is are things being checked for functionality, they're also having a QA check or UX check as well. And similarly, the, the functionality experimentation with developers, it can feel like a kind of closed wall to designers sometimes, but and similarly with the sketching and prototypers from the development side, but try and try and get some common ground there. And if the tools are blocking you because you're using different ones, then go back to paper and pens and have a shared sandbox and just, just be kind of more open. Go to quick summary. So we've kind of, um, yeah, I've, I've given you a vision of a sort of reimagined editor interface, talked rapidly about co-design and not done it enough justice, but really the crucial part is starting with relationships and mapping out um, and listening to, to editors and taking that on board. Thinking about features and how they're only one part of the solution, that empowering editors is a crucial part of that, as well as learning from the wider community. Given some ideas about alignment of design and development in Agile, um, and that's all I have. I'll go to my resource slide and say, has anybody got any questions? Any Thank questions you. from the floor? Sorry, any questions from the floor? Yes. I can take it. I can hold it. Wow. Uh, where are you in this project? You start. You, you have done the research, and now you're starting to design, or you have finished the design? Because we're working agile, it's kind of an ongoing process. So we're doing pockets of research, and then we're doing some development and design. So we're we're kind of working incrementally. Um, but I can say every feature that we have in the interface now, it's been rooted in an editor need, which is like a huge win for, um, for UX and content design because it's, it's really aligning with what our editors have wanted. And it's a slow process, but we can see the benefits of, of <coughs> having tested this with our um, editors <coughs> just now. So we have a long way to go, I think. We have, um, well, until March, um, we have to until we are turning off the Drupal 7 offering. So it's ages, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, sorry, next question is, are you using Paragraph for Layout Builder or are you customizing everything? Um, sorry, what was that again? Uh, for the, um, the UI you're creating. Yes. Is it a customization of Layout Builder or is it a We haven't used Layout Builder. We've been looking at Paragraphs. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's where we are. Oh, cool. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? Please just show the resources page. Sure. Resources page. Yeah. Sure. Sorry. Oh yeah. Oh. Yes. Um. Yeah. Uh, because you said. Um, editors so often, uh, do you deal with um, anyone from like marketing or anything else around that? Or? So I've used editors as a kind of general term. Um, th some of these are marketeers, some of them are, 
Yeah, it works differently at the university. So the editors will be anybody that has access to the CMS to publish content. So that could be for marketing purposes. It could be across our um, web estate, we um, publish a lot of content for researchers as well as, so much of the marketing content will be aimed at uh, prospective students. We also publish content aimed at students who are currently studying, um, so it's more inf information. Um, and then we also have, like the university has a huge research um, goal and initiative. Um, so a lot of the, the content we publish is, is aimed at kind of growing that and um, so, yeah, I've used editors quite widely, really. To <laughs> we have, um, because it's a devolved community, there's different, everybody has different reasons for publishing content, but it still needs to be designed with the user, the end user in mind, of course, so. All right. Um, do you have any screenshots or can you share any screenshots with us, like how, how the interface currently looks like? Um, I would have to, not quickly, I can definitely get that available, but not just now. I would need to log into our environment and forget my password and do all that. That normally <laughs> happens, but I could definitely get that um, available for you. I can maybe make this available as a kind of resource pack at the end, so I could I could definitely do that. Yeah, it would be cool. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right, anyone else? Or, oh, oh. Ah, yeah, you first. <laughs> so uh, I recognize editors going like, oh, I want to uh, copy and paste a picture in this field and stuff like that. So does you, do you just go to them and say like, I'm sorry, but that's not possible? Or do you uh, did you find a uh, solution to it? or? So you have to, um, I think, with the copy and pasting, you have to understand like where the stuff's coming from that they're getting and the format that it's in. Because one of the things with the copy and pasting is because it's so easy in seven, certainly the way we have it configured, to paste, you can paste 500 words in and then they publish it, they see a preview and they, they realize this is not great content. So they then have to, to go back and they use the tools that are available. Accordions is something that, that people use a lot because they, they want to shorten a page. So it's understanding what that, how much, first of all, like how much control they have over that content and who is providing it. And you know, could they, could they perhaps provide a template to the person that's providing the content so that it comes to them in a chunked way so that then when they get it into the interface, if that could marry up with particular text fields uh, to insert it so that it's already chunked up. So it's it's off, it, like sometimes it doesn't rest in a, a particular feature in a configuration. It's almost like it that will be part of it, but then it will be putting the tools in place so that the person feels able to, to kind of control it, if that makes sense. Um, so with co-design, you try and not restrict people from doing things a particular way. You try and understand why they're doing that and understand the consequences of, and then maybe provide them with other solutions that, that will work for them more sustainably and save them work in the long run. Um, because the, the content, editing the content within the interface is a lot harder to do than preparing the content so that it's ready you know, outside of the interface, and they have more control of, of sharing versions and so on with the people that they're working with, rather than when they're on their own in the interface and they have that responsibility to publish. I hope that answers your question a bit. So and that's why you use paragraphs? Yeah, paragraphs are great for, obviously, modular content and for kind of suggesting yeah. how, the, and, and headings and that kind of, just chunking it up to avoid the, wall of words um, that have been kind of permitted previously with seven, yeah. Thanks. Uh, could, would you be able to give an example of how to incorporate a UX check into development uh, user acceptance testing? Yeah, so obviously it will depend on the structure of your UAT document. The ones that we've dealt with will tend to step by step go through to check that a thing works in a particular way and then there'll be a yes at each one of those. 
Um, I, the way we did it was we included a, a kind of comment, is this working as intended? And if the answer was no, first of all, by saying, is it working as intended? That relied on the person completing the UAT to go back through the JIRA backlog and find out like what the definition of done was for this feature. So, and that would have an editor need attached to it. That was something that we really tried to, well, I tried to get into every thing that was built. Okay, where's the research? And there's a, a, a ticket for that. So they that would involve a check and then they would have to go back and look at that criteria and assess, yes, it's doing this or actually. So an example of when we um, passed our CK editor, um, we Im implemented the CK editor and it all got checked and then when it went through the UAT they had included a box for a strike through on the text which we couldn't allow um, people to use because strike through text on our website is inaccessible so that was something that came through the you know it passed functionality but it on the UAT why is there strike through sorry on the UX se section of there why is there strike through um, because that's the, the whole goal of this. The definition of done said it would create accessible content. So um, it takes a bit of time. And obviously a UAT document can be quite long anyway. But one thing we did do was um, pass it through more than one person. So we'd maybe get a, a technical person to complete it. And then it would also go to a non-technical person to go through the same process and have another set of eyes on it. So we were cross-checking it. Uh, on that point, uh, to what degree do you restrict the formatting options that content editors have? Like, for example, like you say, the strike, the strike through for yep. accessibility reasons. But uh, what happens when you restrict character count? Or because I notice that the more formatting options they have, the more they can break the design yeah. or add loads of content, etc. There is a balance, obviously, and we try and not. The character count would be a way of reducing the amount of text. However, it doesn't acknowledge that there are, it, it can be difficult. And I think with the character count, where we are going to have to restrict it is moving from seven to nine. We had vertical menus, for example, in, se in seven, and we have horizontal in nine. So character count will have to be restricted because it will wrap and look awful. But I think if, you can, it's a balance to strike. and it. But what we've tried to do is like offer templates or content types to kind of show how the content can be structured and then to kind of like inform that with the, um, and with the paragraphs, I think a lot of the time is we took away stuff and then if editors said, where is this? Then we would question, okay, why do you want it? And why can you not do what you want to do with what we've provided? Because it was trying to avoid choice overload because choice overload can lead to inconsistencies because some people will choose one thing some people and there's a degree of interpretation about what one particular paragraph does somebody else will use it differently um so yeah we tried to like start less is more i guess and then if yeah test it and if editors were asking for for a particular thing okay why do you actually need that can you show me an instance of how that works actually let's get to the underlying need and maybe there's a, there's a different way to do it to kind of keep that consistency of content, keeping in mind the end user um, experience, which is, you know, they don't know the internal structure of the university, whoever's reading the pages, they need to see the kind of similar patterns so to, to avoid excess cognitive load trying to make sense of it. So it's a bit of an education piece as well, I think. All right, anyone else? Going once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so you know, you, you said you don't use Layout Builder. And not yet. I, not yet, but you, oh, so I'm still wondering, because why is it the choice or? It wasn't a choice. I think it's, we've gone with what we know. So we, um, Paragraphs was new. Everything has been new because it's from seven to nine. So Paragraphs was new. So we're starting to learn what we can do with paragraphs. And I guess if we find we can't, you know, layout builder becomes more appealing for particular reasons, then we haven't ruled that out, but we haven't started it yet. And it's, um, I think it must be the same in every sort of team. There's limited development resource and we've tried to put it to, to use kind of intelligently and do it incrementally. Um, layout builder would be possibly beneficial, but we wouldn't know until we did maybe some tech discovery into that. 
So I'm sure it's on the roadmap when it comes to sort of solutionizing and, and thinking about potential. But um, but yeah, it wasn't a conscious choice to not use it versus paragraphs. It's just we were we're, we're learning. So. All right, going once, <laughs> going twice. Yep, that's it for our um, the last session. Thank you. Thank you very much for.